so hello friends uh, can you i hope i'm uh, you know easily audible to all of you so thank you very much for allowing me to participate on this you know weekend discussion about rheumatology and um, very thankful to the med synapse uh, team to reach out to me and uh, and to help me share my experience about rheumatology a little background about myself is that um, my name is shakeeb qureshi and i'm originally from lahore pakistan and i studied from king edward medical college and then after that i went to uh, united states immediately to pursue my further medical career and i got board certified in internal medicine from pittsburgh and therefore and, and after that i had my fellowship uh, uh, studies done at uh, university of oklahoma in oklahoma city then i got board certified in rheumatology as well and uh, i started a program of rheumatology in delaware which is where now jo uh, the president joe biden is from and uh, that is a second smallest state in the in united states we are we have two uh, hospital uh, campuses there it's a very large healthcare system where i was uh, where i started this program it was largely academic uh, program and uh, we grew pretty big very quickly and um, i was uh, made the section head of the department in 2007 two years after uh, joining it and then uh, i stayed as a section head until 2019 i was the president of the delaware rheumatology society as well also the lead physician there uh, a part of that was uh, developing uh, different uh, protocols uh, teaching students and residents as well and um, uh, we actually made evidence based guidelines for the treatment of different rheumatological diseases there uh, we cross collaborated with other uh, uh, similar organizations such as in johns hopkins rheumatology program uh, in jefferson and stuff uh, it was quite a collaborative work uh, where, where we had very complicated patients as being a tertiary care center so into i was a, a national local and a national speaker as well uh, came to speak in dubai a few times pakistan many times and in 2019 2018 and 2019 kind of i made um, a switch from my full time job to more of a multi role kind of a, a person and i moved back to pakistan and started um, serving there bringing the quality of care of united states tertiary care level to lahore and we are we actually doing a lot of um, uh, 90% in person but a lot of telemedicine too uh, to outreach to those areas where they they have very hard time traveling to us and after that i also uh, became director of a of an on site and tele rheumatology program because uh, in 2016 and 2018 i was did some uh, a uh, program for indian health services where i uh, did a outreach program to underserved community via telemedicine when actually nobody knew about tele rheumatology so i was uh, the pioneer of that in uh, in united states and uh, now actually i'm uh, i'm serving uh, actually very it's very unique that i'm actually working in pakistan and united states half and half but at the same time actually i will i'm also boarded and certified in uh, rheumatology in malaysia we actually have some friends where they used to invite me for lectures and i have seen actually patients even there so i can tell you the experience of working in so many areas there is a lot of difference between how the disease presents the epidemiology is very different um the disease presentation is amazingly different for example the gout that we have in united states versus pakistan versus malaysia entirely different uh malaysians and indonesians have a very very high uh, incidence of gout which is kind of almost unreal and most probably it's a genetic issue and i my guess is that it's at the renal, renal tubular level where they have a problem with the uh, the uric acid excretion and hence they develop gout at very early age and massive uh, tophaceous gout which we don't and there are a lot of other differences that one of the academic meetings that we can have we can discuss gout and how it present differently in so many three countries that i've been working in and how the management was so 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 much different in these areas at the same time you know um, uh, i think today's a uh, port uh, platform i think uh, that you wanted to talk to me about was more focused on rheumatoid arthritis but i'll be you know very open to um, disease uh, discussion of any kind in rheumatology because we have seen some of the rarest and the rarest kind you know being at the at the level of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, level where i've served in uh, in so many capacities we have seen anything which is very unusual that some of the people might not even know about the names of so we have uh, you know Pontchart's disease, you know, Sappho syndrome, uh, spinal gout, those kind of things, you know, familial Mediterranean fever and different autoimmune inf uh, inflammatory fever syndromes. We've seen them all, you know, the the rare of the rare kinds. Uh, but if you have to uh, ask me questions about rheumatoid arthritis, uh, I welcome you to ask me any questions, and I'll try to make it very simple so that most of the people can understand, and then take it from there.
you know basically uh, <clears throat> the main question always uh, i've certain videos on online for that as well is that main question whenever somebody comes to you in our office is not that you have to uh, immediately say okay this is rheumatoid arthritis or this is what it basically the main crunch question is that what is the pain coming from first question is it is is it arthritic pain or is it non arthritic pain the pain can come from just fibromyalgia or from muscle disease or from an injury or is it more like a arthritic pain once you know that it's an arthritic pain and i'll tell you later on how we differentiate that too if there is time if this is an arthritic pain the next question is is it inflammatory or is it non inflammatory the non inflammatory is where it's degenerative arthritis where it's basically wear and tear arthritis many people may even want to call it like an old age arthritis i refrain from that term i think age is a very relative term but it's basically something as a part of your um, you know having putting on number of years on your body that your body has some joint uh, you know destruction the cartilage destruction and basically the pain from there but on the contrary the inflammatory arthritis have uh, you know uh, can affect anyone from the age 1 to 2 i've seen like a 2 years old, old uh, kid actually when i was rotating in pediatric rheumatology during my fellowship all the way to like 90 years old i've seen 90 95 years old i've seen so inflammatory arthritis and i think today's your main focus is on rheumatoid arthritis because there are others like as you mentioned we initially when we were chatting about like psoriasis psoriatic arthritis including spondylitis gout lupus but they're all actually inflammatory arthritis whether whether it's even reactive arthritis or septic arthritis but um, rheumatoid arthritis typically can as i already mentioned about the age range it can fluctuate from all the way or inflammatory arthritis from the very early to the end but the peak incidence is somewhere between 20 to 40 to 50 and most like and there is a female predominance how we really diagnose is that somebody coming into our office history is the number one i have been telling actually all my students over the year resident is that there is no shortcut for history taking in rheumatology at least by just taking a good history and then complementing it with a good physical examination I, my mind has already been made up like whether this is rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory versus something else so there are some clues in the history for example somebody starting as i already said at the early age early age is not going to be inflammatory uh, non inflammatory arthritis or at least osteoarthritis it can be fibromyalgia yes but early age arthritis when there is a swelling of the joint so what you're going to ask the patient for is morning stiffness what is the duration of the morning stiffness whether it was an acute presentation whether it was a slowly progressive presentation how many joints are involved is it more in one area versus the other when somebody says my body hurt my body from head to toe hurts and there is no joint findings that's not rheumatoid arthritis that got to be something you know uh, my facial pain or fibromyalgia but when somebody comes tells you that my pain you know i started experiencing some morning stiffness difficulty in closing my hands the fingers were swollen they were painful uh you know and my even feet were difficult in the morning to get up and they were swollen and painful um you know i could not move my elbow because it was swollen you you're getting clues that this is more than just routine kind of a thing going on and it took me about an hour to get up and it took me about an hour to kind of start get moving and then after that the rest of the day was not that bad but the moment i sit down again to take a rest to you know or or drive my car try to get up from the car and i'm again stiff all over that is more of an inflammatory arthritis so we are getting now towards that so then the next step is the joint examination so joint examination for any rheumatologist is the key uh we teach it to all our students so typically inflammatory arthritis or in this case rheumatoid arthritis has a strong predilection to affect the wrist joints wrist joints are never primary osteoarthritis uh mcp joints are never primary osteoarthritis they got if they are swollen and painful you have to figure out what's going on this is not routine or degenerative arthritis pip joints if they are swollen are one of the areas where rheumatoid arthritis can affect dip joints now osteoarthritis primarily affects the pip and the dips rheumatoid arthritis the other ones that i talked about and then psoriatic arthritis can affect the dips so that's a whole separate topic then elbow joints elbow joints are never primary osteoarthritis shoulders can be a mix shoulders are very hard to uh, kind of uh, palpate because they are big so most of we have to take the you know ask the patient to undress and we can compare the shoulders if there is one is swollen versus the other and then we uh, check the range of motion and everything else uh, elbow joints elbow joints as i said like you have to palp you have to be very good in palpation of the elbow joints they are behind the lacrimal fossa and mostly the patient is not able to extend their arms like fully that's one of the clues 
um other areas where rheumatoid arthritis can affect is uh, mainly is uh, hip joints knee joints ankle joints smaller joints of the feet so those are actually like the toes especially those are the typical areas where rheumatoid arthritis can affect rare cases you can even if you have the tmj joints you know and uh, so those are the areas which not typically don't happen uh, once you know with your examination and the history taking that this is rheumatoid arthritis the next step is now ordering the relevant blood work testing and imaging now why do we get imaging we get imaging because we only establish a baseline somebody coming in for five years uh, history we, there must be some radiographic changes of rheumatoid arthritis that we can find from the imaging so we typically image the, inv the uh, involved joints but mostly we have to end up getting the hands and wrist x-rays and we can see the early changes are the periarticular osteopenia and if you find something more than that would be the typical erosions of uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the joints that we are talking about mcps pips and uh, wrist joints and stuff so rheumatoid arthritis erosions are very different than uh, uh, chronic tuberous gout erosions they can mimic they can look very similar and similarly there is an entity called erosive osteoarthritis their erosions are very typical very different so rheumatic arthritis erosions are very typical and very different we actually have recently seen some tremendous cases uh, hopefully we can share them in the future sometime and then uh, after uh, so the blood work that you're going to be ordering is basically we order cbc we ordered the uh, the lfts and room uh, rfts the reason we order all them if we want to see what they, if the if the wbc is high or not if there is any anemia or not if any uh, platelets are getting affected similarly uh, we get the lfts because not only for the you know for the rheumatoid arthritis but if you have to if you are so certain that this is rheumatoid arthritis we want to start them on some medication and a lot of those medication cannot be started if your liver functions are not normal so similarly um, uh, kidney functions we get again for therapeutic purposes because we want to start them on some kind of medications uh, we get esr the inflammatory markers to see whether it's you know if esr is high that's one of the supporting things it's not diagnostic but it's supportive rheumatoid factor we order we order anti ccp anti ccp and rheumatoid factor combined can give you a pretty high specific specificity and sensitivity um other than that obviously we order all the other panels that can mimic as an inflammatory arthritis such as ana we're going to be ordering uh hepatitis b and c because if you are certain is inflammatory arthritis hepatitis b and c in fact can cause uh, arthritis itself Uh, hepatitis C, in fact, arthropathy mimics rheumatoid arthritis. And the other caveat is that hepatitis C itself, if it is positive, can give you a false positive rheumatoid factor to make the things more complicated. The difference is that anti-CCP will be negative in uh, hepatitis C arthropathy, and they will not be the typical erosions of rheumatoid arthritis. So, if we have this question which is lingering, we end up actually getting the hepatitis C treated anyway. because once the hepatitis hepatitis C is treated that particular thing will be gone from our mind that there is any overlap and plus we will be able to give the medications more freely once the hepatitis C is, has been treated other than that we also order TSH because a hypo or hyperthyroidism can mimic uh, rheumatoid arthritis presentation and can even cause synovitis in some cases so we get the TSH out of the way we actually if you are so certain that this is rheumatoid arthritis we end up many time getting TB testing done too in south asian and uh, population in middle east it would be very relevant because uh, for two reasons one is that uh, tb itself can cause a different arthritic uh, kind of presentations but mainly what we get in uh, united states or more developed countries is that we want to put them on biologic medications so once we have to put them on biologic medication we want to make sure that their um, tb testing was negative otherwise it's uh, it's not a very safe medication to get them started on so after that um, pretty much once we have established the diagnosis we have the uh you know uh, the diagnosis confirmed then the next question is the is the therapeutic choice so then we have a good sit down with the patient we already give them educational materials on all the from american college of rheumatology website they have good very good educational leaflets for patient education from the very first visit i'm pretty certain with my experience that this is rheumatoid arthritis then already i give them rheumatoid arthritis a handout to read about so that if they have any questions when they come back i can answer them all and similarly we are not starting from like point a so they they are already from we are to point b or c and similarly uh, i give them information on methotrexate the the frontline dmards even biologic dmards so we give them all that information and when the patient comes back they be all mentally prepared to discuss the next step so this is in a nutshell the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis is very important because there is a window of opportunity in the beginning because uh, if you don't treat it properly with the dmards or biologic dmards what happens is 
that uh, <clears throat> what mainly the problem is that whatever damage has been done to the joints cannot be reversed. <clears throat> so the patients who have already developed some deformities and disabilities, especially this breaks my heart in Pakistan because this happens all the time in Pakistan because of uh, either the patient doesn't have the capacity to go to the doctors living in these areas where there's no rheumatologist or uh, they have not enough money to even uh, get help initially. So they can delay their, you know, they can keep taking painkillers or they can go to the Hakeem and get like all those different kind of steroids. And that's a whole different dilemma, you know, I face, face in Pakistan. So uh, the ground reality of treatment in Pakistan versus uh, United States versus I'm pretty sure in Dubai would be very different. Uh, depending upon what the personal beliefs of the patient are. Because that, there are a lot of misunderstandings in our population too back home. Uh, we strongly believe that a lot of, uh, you know, supplements can just treat the arthritis. Uh, we have more of a fixation on supplements like kawas and you know the teas and you know the like even with corona you might have be familiar with what happened with coronavirus when it initially came there were more like there was so much um, misinformation and misguidance about that like people were selling their steams and the kawas and whatever you know different kind of uh, supplements rather than you know, there was no evidence-based stuff <clears throat> that can lead to the lag of uh, diagnosis and we lose that window of opportunity and i've seen kids there i recently saw like Day before yesterday, I was doing telemedicine for Pakistan. A 13 years old girl actually was already lost her hip joint. Uh, she had ankylosing spondylitis. Nobody could diagnose. They were just calling it like routine pain and stuff. Uh, I saw an ankylosing spondylitis kid actually, 18 years old. Rip roaring is already, uh, uh, you know, lost both, both of his hip joints. And it is a very preventable, very treatable disease. That's what I want to people to have more awareness and come early if they have any questions like this. <clears throat> uh, it's not a part of the routine however it's a uh, because we try to kind of uh, you know minimize like exposure but but in some ways it's very relevant for example we were talking about that there are so many um, other uh, inflammatory arthritis and one of them is called sarcoidosis so sarcoidosis can present as low low grain syndrome low grain syndrome actually is where you have uh, arthritis and you have uh, the erythema nodosum and you can have the chest radiograph positive so that is actually an acute sarcoid presentation and in that case actually it's very relevant. Similarly, it's relevant if you are suspecting TB. Also, it's very relevant if there is any clinical findings. For example, if there is any crackles, as we all know in rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, yesterday I saw a patient where the patient was misdiagnosed as asthma. For years and years she was taking inhalers and she was on oxygen. I said like typically patient on asthma are like not on oxygen. And she came as rheumatoid arthritis. and. Uh, she had rip roaring antibody positivity. She had all the joints, and but then she had massive crackles in the lungs. And I ordered the chest X-ray, and it's an interstitial lung disease. In fact, in her case, I'm ordering a, a high-resolution res, high CT scan because high-resolution CT scan is going to give me information whether I want to, uh, you know, uh, you know, there is a component what we call NSIP for the pulmonologist. I would tell them NSIP versus UIP. So if it's NSIP ILD, we can give them uh, medication to stop the further progression of the ILD which is very important. Similarly, <clears throat> there's a lot of other connective tissue diseases other than rheumatoid arthritis, such as scleroderma, such as lupus. And see, we've seen them all where they can affect uh, the, the lungs in uh, different ways. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can cause pleural fusion. It can, uh, it can cause pericardial effusion. Uh, similarly, um, you know, scleroderma can cause uh, very uh, disabling lung disease. Uh, lupus can mimic, present in many ways. It can present in the form of uh, uh, bleeding from the lungs, hemoptysis. Uh, diffusal alveolar hemorrhage so chest x-ray is very important but those patients are sicker than just chest x-ray you know similarly vasculitis patients vasculitis patients you know like uh, gpa uh, the wagoners what we used to call can present with the uh, chest x-ray findings so if you are thinking about vasculitis related arthritis then the chest x-ray has a very uh, routine role but i would not just expose any patient without findings if it's just rheumatoid arthritis to a chest x-ray because any radiology exposure, we don't want. In the Western part of the world, we do not want to expose patients to a lot of unnecessary radiation because, you know, we all know it can lead to eventually cancer and whatnot. Yeah. So, rheumatoid arthritis, when we have established the diagnosis, uh, we divide into whether it, what is is it a mild presentation, is it a moderate presentation, or severe. The difference between all this will lie upon how many joints are involved, how acute is the presentation. Uh, and uh, what is the ESR, uh, whether the patient has rheumatoid nodules or not. These are all the markers of severe disease. So if somebody has a very severe disease on presentation, then we treat them hard. Similarly, if somebody presents with just like one or two fingers swollen, minimal uh, stiffness, 
we can just get away with giving them like the frontline, uh, you know, uh, uh, routine demands such as a minimal dose of uh, methotrexate or, or hydroxychloroquine. So this is how we differentiate. And uh, there are some blood tests available in USA, you know, where uh, there is a composite score. I don't want to promote them, but you know, I'm not take the name and stuff. But there are panels which can, uh, uh, which have a composite score of different inflammatory markers to give you a certain level. Uh, where you can actually also say whether it's mild, moderate, or severe and treat it accordingly. Then there are actually um, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, composite scores that we can do in our uh, clinic while their patients are there. For study purposes, they're done all the time. The HEX scoring, the CDI scoring, and they are actually a scoring system where it's based on uh, physician, uh, you know, assessment, the patient, uh, you know, complaints, and then radiograph and blood test combined. And then we can make a composite score whether this is mild moderate or severe like DAS scoring DAS scoring is one of the scoring uh, system which HACK and DAS, DAS scoring is which ACR uses as a, as a guideline for mild moderate or severe or even remission after we start the patient on treatment whether the patient going, goes into remission or not we use all these composite scoring uh, methods you know uh, so family syndrome was one of the a very important because I've taken boards multiple times I'm uh, certified in rheumatology twice internal medicine four times actually so uh, Frenetti syndrome used to be a very favorite board question, and it's not anymore. And the reason actually is that we don't see Frenetti's anymore. Uh, for some odd reason, the, the disease of rheumatoid arthritis has become very mild, like nothing as compared to what used to be in the past. I've seen rheumatoid vasculitis twice, and that was a very early in my career. With, I think there are a couple of things that have happened. One is that the, thera the therapeutic choices now are very good, and we catch the disease very early and treat them very hard. And no, normally the complications never happen. And similarly, um, uh, you know, that somehow the epidemiology has changed too. All those weird things that in your medical school you might have heard about, like the eye effect, you know, the scleritis, episcleritis, you know, the, the mononeuritis multiplex. Uh, those used to be the favorite board question of internal medicine, actually, with rheumatoid arthritis, atlantoaxial subluxation. We don't see them anymore, Faltis. So the Falti syndrome has really been, become relatively uncommon. It's more of an academic question, yes. So Falti's patient would mostly present someone who has a very advanced rheumatoid arthritis. This means having a very long, bad rheumatoid arthritis with high CCP, multiple rheumatoid nodules, neutropenia, and they develop this uh, high, big spleen. So uh, basically, again, as I said, it's not very common, but once you find Faltis, you have to treat it with either methotrexate and even bi biologics or sometimes it's cyclophosphamide, it used to be. But um, typically, you know, uh, it, 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 uh, we don't see that that much. So it's almost become a question uh, where uh, it's whenever you see one, you're going to treat one. Uh, there is an entity actually to make it more complicated called pseudo -faltis. So pseudo -faltis can look like Faltis. And a part of that would be like LGL syndrome. LGL is uh, one of the complications of uh, rheumatoid arthritis where you can have large granular lymphocytic syndrome. Now, these are all those oddballs that are routine doctors would not even care about. And that's why we don't even talk about it because this is more of a very high tech uh, academic rheumatology discussion. And I don't think a regular routine person other than some hematologist would be looking into it, you know, where he'll be differentiating or she'll be differentiating between a few things with leukemia or lymphoma. So um, that's why I think these things are discussed less and less now. How many times have I seen scleritis and episcleritis? Like two or three times, you know. Although I was at like, I've seen patients on the most complicated end as well. Faltis, how many times? Like two or three times, you know. Um, Atlanto exit subluxation in the very beginning of my career. We, we typically don't see them anymore because of how we treat the disease. Um, uh, swan neck and, uh, you know, those uh, used to be like those swan neck deformities, boutonnieres. Remember, those used to be your main, uh, you know, kind of medical school board questions and stuff. We only see them in the patients who were treated in the non-biological era, you know. So we don't see them that much, but we do see them more, relatively more commonly. Still, because there are a lot of patients from 70s, 80s, 90s, or even 2000, or, or patients in the third world country where again, uh, the therapeutic choices are pretty limited. We see, still see all those oddballs. So in, uh, in in Pakistan and India, I'm pretty sure we'll still be seeing a lot of those things because uh, over there, you know, the therapeutic choices are very limited. And that's where I think uh, my whole mission when I wanted to go back to Pakistan was to try to establish the level of care that um, the, the local people probably are, uh, pro not probably, actually definitely deserve, but probably are not getting. So I think that's why I was very happy when you contacted me because this video might create an awareness, uh, you know, which um, may reach out to all those people who are uh, who need this healthcare. 
Yeah, so my opinion is uh, unbiased. I'm going to give you my own unbiased opinion. Uh, Jax is the last of the biologic so far that, you know, the therapeutic group uh, which have been uh, come to the market has been there for a while though, Profacitinib especially. And then came Baracitinib and now there's other others, you know, Jax, Pedacitinib and stuff in USA. The main problem actually, so they are very efficacious. So first question is about efficacy. They are very efficacious. There is a convenience about uh, them being oral, you know, and their uh, indications are expanding too. Um, I think when we when we think about a patient, uh, the reason actually rheumatology and a physician and a, and a well-educated or well-experienced uh, physician counts is that not every patient is the same. There are certain risks that are, uh, one patient has that the other patient doesn't have. Uh, clinical presentation is different, comorbidities are different. In case, case of Jack, I know that, uh, you know, so the number one cause of death in uh, rheumatoid arthritis is, do you know what that is? Um, so number one cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis is, this is a board question actually for yeah. all those board takers, yeah. is coronary artery disease. So patients with, it's a systemic inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm. So coronary artery disease, thought to be an inflammatory process too, can be a little premature in patients like they can develop early. Now the problem with JAKs are they are more efficacious probably than TNFs. Uh, their studies have been done and the TNFs. The problem is the safety, you know, so we are playing with two parts. One is efficacy and the other part is safety. So you're trading uh, efficacy with safety most of the time, you know, what, what, what do you want? Because there are many people I just keep them on synthetic, with the, the routine DMARDs, synthetic DMARDs. I don't put them on biologic DMARDs because why? Because I feel that if they have any history of, uh, let's say cancer very recently, or they have a history of TB recently, I'm not going to be putting them on biologics though I can. I know they're more efficacious than synthetic DMARDs. The problem is that with JAK inhibitors, there were recently some more red flags were raised. So how they are different than the other drugs like anti-TNFs is that uh, they, can, they have a high risk of DVTs. They have uh, a high risk of recurrence of uh, shingles. You know, so they can, those, now shingles can be mitigated by giving you shingles vaccination before you can get them started like, you know, the, but the problem actually lies is that the recently there are a couple more signals that were uh, brought into the uh, into the awareness was one of them actually was more heart events, more mace events, what we call now in cardiology. And uh, there is a more uh, signal of some lung cancer probably. Now the, the, the drug, drug makers are trying to defend that and they said like it's a very small incidence, but whenever such big, because we always had this question about jacks that they do tweak the, uh, the, the cholesterols. And uh, they were always defending it that no, it only affects the good cholesterols. And so it doesn't matter, you know, overall everything is okay. But now there is some safety signals about MACE events, stroke and heart disease and some cancer. So I'll look into it more before I really start saying, okay, you know, they're entirely safe and use them. The problem actually is, and especially what I'm concerned about in countries like India and Pakistan is that patient will go for the convenience of the oral medication. And, uh, you know, and it may become like, a, you know, a drug where, I don't know about India, but in Pakistan, there's hardly any control over uh, how do you prescribe medication. Many times I see physical therapists prescribing medications. <laughs> yeah, sometimes even DMARDs, there's no control, there's no legal, uh, you know, so which is kind of a something that um, really I get scared about sometimes. So if such an easy medication, oral medication, nobody knows about the safety part becomes available. I, I think, and plus these safety signals, uh, I think population at large may get affected. Uh, individuals might not be but they are very efficacy don't get me wrong they're very efficacy like yeah, their efficacy is very good they are very good drugs the only thing is that i would want to wait more about and I've, I've been using them actually it's not that i've not been using them for the patients who really want a convenience of an oral, oral medication and or, or if they have feared other medications uh, but i'm on the fence a little bit recent from, from the recent data and i will actually want to know more about it before i can say okay no they're they're, they're as good as anything else from the safety point of view, not from the efficacy point of view. From the efficacy point of view, I think they're pretty efficacious. Extremely good question. And uh, this question uh, was answered by ACR guidelines. Anybody can go to American College of Rheumatology website in 2010. In fact, uh, last year, that was my topic uh, uh, of uh, lecture that I gave in Pakistan in the national meeting in Lahore. And uh, so ACR came with not guidelines, it was like, more of a yeah kind of guidelines where they'll tell you actually how to manage a pregnancy not only just rheumatoid arthritis but overall in all the rheumatological conditions because of therapeutic choices and this is a very very relevant question because mostly as i said the, the patients are females 
and uh, primarily females and uh, in and of the childbearing age and the problem is in pakistan at least you can tell me about india part is that they are very sensitive about uh, actually having kids the moment they get married kids is the only thing they want to have you know and and <laughs> and not only that uh, the problem is that even if they have two or three kids sadly speaking in pakistan if they don't have a son you know the family is still pushing them for more pregnancy so in ideal world like in in, in pa- for example in america after two kids they're done so and but that's not the issue in pakistan they they they, they would have to have more kids from the social pressure not that maybe the the girl is not making most of those choices this is the pressure of the whole family or oh, you want to have somebody you know who can carry the name of you know the you know, which i don't personally believe in uh you know my beliefs are different more secular more like liberal in that regard but uh but that that is a problem there you know where uh, uh there is a issue with the childbearing age women so why i'm saying that is because methotrexate is contraindicated lafrunamide which is widely used in pakistan because of the lack of other therapeutic choices and affordability of the biologics you know what 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 about lafrunamide the problem with lafrunamide is that as as compared to root order like methotrexate you can stop and you'll be good after a few months or a few weeks lafrunamide you have to give a wash out you have to give them cholestyramine so that is a pretty bad kind of a like 11 days course a lot of people can't even tolerate that but you have to get the lafrunamide out of your system before you can even try conception so lafrunamide again is a is a serious drug uh similarly um uh, the um, you know uh rituximab plus minus is not entirely safe um salsap not safe so those are the kind of things what are the drugs that can be used in rheumatoid arthritis then that, that's the next question in if the, somebody wants to now well control and i've done that in a lot of patients in pakistan the ones who get controlled i can i can tell them okay you know just delay your pregnancy give me some time i put them on proper demards once the disease is under control i would stop the methotrexate and uh, and continue them on so if they cannot afford then sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine is safer choices before during conception and afterwards too now if uh, if if they can afford biologics uh the sertoluzumab simzia actually is is a pegylated mo- molecule so it does not cross the placenta and it's a, it con- it's considered to be safe throughout the pregnancy similarly uh the other biologics such as antitnfs they are considered to be safe actually uh there was some recommendation in uh, you know last year's uh, guidelines that actually they the etanercept and the other ones non sertoluzumab should be stopped in the last trimester i don't know how much evidence based that is but uh, they at that point they want to make sure that when the kid is born you know you know you don't want to continue the one at the last trimester and there might be some placental test you know transfer but overall i think uh, that uh, you know they will be considered okay now the newer biologics nobody knows i think the jacks are not allowed again <laughs> the paracetamol but tofazidinib because they're smaller molecules now smaller molecules can easily cross the placenta and you know we don't know what they can do so i think they are not uh, very safe uh, drugs in that regard cyclophosphamide entirely contraindicated but remember one thing uh, not rheumatoid arthritis but other rheumatology illnesses where you have to save the life of the of the mother uh, you go for the mother so in that uh, that case all the bets are off you know and that at that point somebody having a let's say uh, a lupus um, brain disease where she's having like a major um, lupus uh, you know nephritis or cerebritis and there's no other choice you got to do what you got to do if you have to save the save the mother you got to save the mother um and the, in fact lupus you know rheumatology in pregnancy by itself is a one hour talk you know because uh, there are a lot of other things like anti phospholipid antibody syndrome which can really affect the the mothers in a very different way uh and uh can be pretty devastating to control um especially the cap syndrome so um it's a very relevant and important question you asked and especially applies to a lot of people and sorry if i sent a few uh uh you know politically incorrect things but uh, that's how what happens uh that that you know it's very important that women of childbearing age we should discuss everything with them have almost a sit down with them to discuss these things because rheumatoid arthritis is something else but that having a healthy child for the rest of their life is very important epis are the gatekeepers uh even in the uh, united states and everywhere else uh, they are the first contact for every patient and uh, hats off to the gps because you know they do, they are uh, i think their job is more difficult than ours because we are focused on one of the you know few things and stuff in but they have to deal with 
nephrology, you know, oncology, everything. And so for them, I think if they, if my only guidance to GP is that if if you have a younger person, like if it's not a typical one, like your knee is hurting at the age of 60 and it's a slowly progressive disease, or your back is uh, hurting in the lower back of a 55, 60 years old guy, or somebody just, you know, was picking up heavy something from the floor, to remember any red flags in anything in rheumatology. For, for example, 90% of the back pain is degenerative pain. And, and most of it gets better by just like, it can be very bad to begin with, but with all the conservative management, it does get better. So red flags, for example, in a back pain are, if somebody has fever, along with that means infection, somebody has weight loss or has localized tenderness, make sure it's not cancer. Uh, make sure uh, somebody has a young male like you guys, you know, you here or whoever, 20, 30, is having a back pain in the morning, every morning for the last, you know, one or two years, where they, every day they wake up and they have a stiffness for one hour and that goes away after an hour and then they feel good. Think about ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthropathies. They present in a very subtle way. In fact, in many studies they say the average lag time to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis can vary anywhere from three to seven years. And you know, just because of this thing, because because NSAIDs work, but they only work for the pain. They're not stopping the joint damage. And what the, what what is the first thing you're going to take? You're going to take a brufin, ibuprofen, or something like that. You know, a leave or you know uh, something naproxen, and it does help you. And who wants to go to a doctor? You know, I mean, like so. But those are the red flags. Then another thing is, if you see somebody younger one having uh, pain and ache and swelling, don't mess around with it. That is a patient you really want to get into a, a physician very quickly, a rheumatologist very quickly, so that they can get so. Because what breaks my heart is a lot of younger patients come to my practice in Pakistan. They're already crippled, and I feel so bad that they could have been saved. That that's my only uh, only uh, you know kind of a problem. So I think the GPs, my advice to GPs is anything where they feel uh, they suspect that this is out of the ordinary, this is not run of the mill, especially younger people. Mostly, it's not. It's got to be something else, not just uh, like a routine problem. Other than obviously the back pains and the other things that I talked about. If it's not trauma related, for example, somebody heard, like while playing football, somebody heard a pop in the knee and it swelled up. That's not rheumatology, you know. Send them to sports medicine or orthopedic or treat, to treat them yourself. This is more like a sports injury, you know. So, so a good GP would know what to do. But these are my general guidelines. Yeah, I think my main message is that, you know, I really want to thank all the doctors and all the healthcare workers, not only doctors, any frontline workers, because the last year was one of the most, like the nastiest years of my life. Uh, not only my life, but uh, everybody's life. It basically, we lost a lot of friends. I personally lost a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, doctor, senior doctors that I knew, uh, parents of my, uh, you know, friends. Uh, uh, actually, one of my friends, lost his son actually at the age of he was like 22 23 years old who was a, a first year medical student or something or second year or something and he he, he died uh, on either day in fact and uh, you know it was on the national news and stuff so the healthcare workers uh, you know are heroes uh, they put their life at risk um, uh, whether they be nurses respiratory therapist you know uh, all the specialties all the frontline doctors gps internists family practitioners they, they put their, um, uh, you know, life at risk to uh, take care of the patients. And as a result of that, they lost their lives. So uh, I'm pretty sure that they're in a very nice place now. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, my heartfelt condolences to all their family members. And uh, I think um, uh, this is a special, this is a field that we, we, we serve humanity, we make money, but at the same time, we get prayers anyway. So th there's no, there's nothing, uh, there's no profession in the world where you are earning, uh, we in, uh, as a Muslim call it sawab or, you know, other, uh, you know, religions have their own way of interpreting it, but, uh, uh, and get paid for that too. I mean, like this is, this is just amazing. And we also have a capacity to not take money from the people who can't pay. So there is something actually amazing. You know, uh, this is almost like uh, some uh, uh, divine kind of powers mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the almighty has given you all as well uh, mm -hmm. to, Kind of be a mini god, you know, uh, you know, where you will be deciding, you know, whether you want to, you know, charge someone or not. So my only other advice to people is that out there is that we all took a oath. So make sure that if you are, uh, if there's someone who's deserving who cannot pay, if in if it is in, in your capacity to treat that patient, try to not treat them differently. Try to give them the same importance that you will give to someone who can 
you know, money will come regardless. You know, I've mm-hmm. seen that money, if, if you don't run for money, money will still come to you. A decent amount that le- will let you live. So I think uh, that's my only, let's say, message. And again, thank you to all those uh, heroes out there.